Hello and welcome to the Sustainable Resource Management section on Building Material Recovery and Reuse. Uh, I'm Ann Nicklin. I'm the Executive Director of the Building Materials Reuse Association uh, and I will be talking today about kind of the major points of Building Materials Recovery and Reuse. Uh, in short, the Building Materials Reuse Association is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we're membership based and we're committed to education, uh, education entirely about the recovery and reuse of materials and how to get that information into as many people's hands as possible so that we can help encourage greater number, greater amounts of uh, reuse and recovery. So today what I'm going to be talking about are four major points. Um, first of all, uh, of course, the fundamental principles and practices of building materials recovery and reuse. Uh, just a general overview of what is recovery. Um, is that the deconstruction that people are talking about? Yes, it is. Um, generally, recovery is deconstruction. Uh, what is reuse? We'll be talking about that right in the beginning of the session. Uh, secondly, we'll be talking about historical approaches to building materials recovery and reuse. Is this a new practice? Um, and whether it's a new practice or not, where is it going? Uh, what are the trends in research and market expansion? Uh, building materials recovery and reuse and the triple bottom line. Uh, I know that this course as a whole is really using the triple bottom line, uh, what's sometimes called people, planet, profit, uh, or as I sometimes refer to it, environment, economics, and ethical. Uh, how do we use that triple bottom line to look at recovery and reuse and how do we integrate that with larger questions about sustainable materials management? Uh, and then finally, what is the the availability of incorporating reuse into a project waste management plan? I think the the reason I hope that most of you are here is to identify new opportunities, new solutions uh, for your either project or county or whatever your relevant area is. How do you really start to use these new ideas and how do you start to incorporate them on the ground? Now before we get too far into the presentation, I'd like to to just take a minute to say you know, why are we even talking about building materials? Uh, I know that the larger sustainable resource management course is looking at all materials. Uh, it's looking at how you source materials, it's looking at how you recycle materials, compost, landfill, etc. Um, but usually it, it talks about materials in a generic sense. Um, what I'd like to, to point out before we get much further is the scale of building materials. Um, oftentimes we kind of forget that they're there. Uh, you know, despite the fact that we spend probably upwards of 90% of our lives inside of buildings, they just kind of fall into the background. But if you look at this graph on the top, uh, this is the 20th century, so the information may be a few years old now, but it is quite comprehensive uh, in the scale of time that it looked at. And it shows the different kinds of materials um, that have been consumed in the United States during the 20th century. Uh, and you can see the bright red is non-renewable organics, um, that kind of thing. And then if you look at the, the biggest piece of that graph, the, uh, the kind of the cream color at the top here, those are construction materials, just construction materials. So this is how we house our people. This is the commercial buildings where we work, those institutional buildings, government buildings. Um, this is far and away our greatest amount of consumption uh, and that's been growing over the 20th century to an enormous degree. Uh, in addition, if you look at waste trends, uh, you know, unfortunately the most recent waste trend analysis that we have is from 2003, but that's showing that between 40 and 60 percent of the average waste stream or of the national waste stream is construction and demolition materials. So not only are we consuming construction and building materials at uh, a very rapid rate um, and in, in a grossly outsized rate to the rest of the materials, uh, but we also throw them away at a huge rate. And then at the bottom there, um, you can look at the amount of renewable versus non-renewable materials that we consume. So we consume a huge amount of construction materials and we tend to think of them as disposable, uh, as a once-off, sort of like a, a Ziploc baggie. Uh, so that house around you um, or that building around you that you're looking at, uh, most folks tend to dispose that in a landfill. And so what I want to talk about today is uh, how important building materials are and how great the opportunity is for taking those materials out of the waste stream and getting them back into a reuse stream. Now what is reuse? Oftentimes people think of reuse and, and recycling as interchangeable. Uh, at its simplest level, reuse is to use again, especially after salvaging, special treatment, or processing. 
uh, nearly all reuse requires some element of processing, um, whether it is, you know, taking down the door that might be right next to you. Uh, sometimes you'll have to take off its hinges or you'll have to take the frame with the door. So it takes a certain amount of processing. Uh, but it's, it's just very simply to use it again. Now, how does it interact with the concept of recycling? Um, when we talk about reuse and recycling, we tend to have these very clear boxes that say, okay, here's recycling over here with the Illinois Recycling Association, and here's reuse over here with the Building Materials Reuse Association, and they must deal with two very different topics. You know, the reality is, though, it's much more of a spectrum. It's a pretty fluid definition, um, and one that I don't think is helpful uh, to get overly overly cautious about. Um, the real point is to understand that when you're talking about reuse instead of recycling, you're really talking about how that material is going to be processed. Um, on this graph you can see on the left hand side here at kind of the, the highest level of recycling you've got you know the melting down and recasting of structural seal, really taking it back to uh, a entirely different physical form. Um, taking a solid beam, melting it down into liquid and recasting it. That's recycling. A um, huge amount of energy is, is put into it uh, and the resulting material, the new steel beam, is unrecognizable um, in its link to the original rebar or beams or girders or whatever went into feeding it. Uh, it no longer bears any identifiable connection um, to that product other than its materiality. Uh, in the middle, kind of halfway between recycling and reuse, you get a fair amount of energy applied to chipping wood for mulch. Um, you know, so that would be either uh, urban tree fall, or oftentimes you'll see it with two by fours or dimensional wood that comes off of a project where people will chip it and use it for mulch. So when you look at it, you can't really tell was that a tree, was that a two by four, but you can tell that it it was a piece of wood, um, and you can tell that it still bears a, a solid wood aspect to it. Um, but a fair amount of energy has been put into place to change it significantly from its its state, its arriving state. Uh, and then finally, on the reuse side, when we talk about the denaling of two by fours, so if say a residential house comes down and a number of two by fours come out of that building, you want to remove the nails so that it's easier to reuse that material. Now that is processing; labor does go into that, but it's a relatively small amount of labor, and the piece of wood actually comes out looking more like a piece of wood on the other end. Uh, so when we talk about the difference between recycling and reuse, it's it's not necessary to you know play too much of the reuse policeman, uh, but it is important to understand why we talk about reuse as different from recycling. Yeah, there's some gray area. Yeah, it's a spectrum and it's all moving towards the same uh, goal of um, keeping materials in the supply stream. But reuse tends to use far less energy. Uh, oftentimes we'll talk about the highest and best use. Uh, when we look at reuse, what we want to achieve is the highest and best use for that material. Now on these kind of three triangles, I think, explain it pretty easily. Um, the blue triangle, retain material usefulness. For example, that 2x4 can still be reused as wood chips or it can be reused as biofuel. We are retaining more future uses for it. In contrast, when a, a wood material is burned or incinerated as part of a biofuel process, it can never be used again. So part of highest and best use is that we're retaining potential uh, future uses, retain material usefulness. In terms of the energy footprint, highest and best use is going to have the lowest energy footprint. We are going to apply the least amount of processing to that material. And then finally value, highest and best use tends to retain the most value for that material. A 2 by 4 will sell for $1.50 in a reuse store or two fifty dollars in a, a Home Depot or a big box kind of store. Uh, but a bag of mulch will sell for buck fifty for probably four 2 by 4s in there. So we want to see the highest value for that material. This uh, graph looks at an example of, you know, if we start at the absolute highest and best uses in, in a wood environment, a living tree is the highest and best use. We've got great ecosystem benefits, it's processing CO2, it's providing shade and animal shelter. Uh, it is has infinite future potential. It could become anything. Uh, and it requires zero processing energy. So that's the highest and best use of a wood product is as a living tree. Beyond that, we get to harvested timber that we can be used for building projects as a structural member, log cabins um, that with very minimal processing, other than felling and relocating that tree, it can be used as a telephone pole. It can be used as a, a wide variety of objects. Now, could that telephone pole or could that log cabin material be used again? Sure, 
It could be used as dressed heavy timber. Now dressed simply means that you're kind of cutting off the rough edges. You're squaring the, the, the material uh, and you're using it as um, still as heavy timber. So at a dimension that's probably at like an 8 by 8 or a 10 by 10 or larger. Uh, but you can still use it for structural applications. It's got a great resistance to fire damage. Um, if you look at some of those old warehouse buildings, they actually have uh, very good fire ratings because uh, the outer materials burn first, um, keeping the inner material still stranding structurally. Now in terms of the energy required to clean the, the timber and shape it to a standard dimension, there is energy involved. Uh, but you've still got a lot of potential future uses. That heavy timber could then become dimensional lumber. It could be cut into 2x4s or 2x6s or flooring. Uh, it can be used in a wide variety of ways, still recognizably timber. Now beyond that, what's the next use after timber? Um, you could reuse it as timber, or if it's been so damaged or it's so short that it can't be reused as timber, it can go into mulch or feedstock. Uh, then it can go into ground cover if it's being used as mulch. If it's being used as feedstock, it could be made into new medium density fiber board or particle board. Uh, but it still has additional future options. Now what happens when that particle board or when that mulch is no longer useful? What do you do with it then? Well, then you can use it as biofuel. You can burn it and at least you're retaining energy, the, the caloric or BTU content of that material. Um, but once you've done that, it's got no future uses. Uh, the other option at kind of the end of life of a wood material, of one of the, the lowest and, and least useful uses, is as alternative daily cover. Uh, if it's been mixed with a lot of other materials and can't reasonably be used as biofuel, you can grind it all up to a, a single dimension uh, and use it as a, uh, a covering of a landfill each day to reduce the amount of fly away and assist in the kind of processing mechanisms of a landfill. So I think this clearly explains highest and best use. Then any opportunity that you have to keep a material in the supply chain or return a material to the supply chain, you always want to focus on retaining the highest and best use. You always want to maximize the value of that material, you want to reduce the amount of energy used to process that material, and you want to maximize the number of future applications. There is no reason that you need to immediately go to biofuel. Take a few steps along the way, encourage it to go into the reuse economy or into the recycling economy first. Now that we've got an idea of kind of what is reuse and how does it relate to recycling. Um, so we've got reuse here. What's the, the historical trend for reuse? This is one example. It's called uh, spolia. Um, this is in Rome. This was a, a wall that was built using uh, portions of a wall that had previously been built. So you can see that we've got kind of uh, rough blocks um, that have no finished edge to them used right alongside blocks that have clearly been etched and marked with uh, with numbers and with lettering uh, and that have clearly been used in a decorative fashion prior to being um, taken apart and reused in another wall. Uh, the reason it's called spolia or why how it's looked at in kind of historical um, times of historical architecture uh, is that it was actually used to signify the end of one reign and the arrival of another. So for instance if an emperor was, was beaten in a war, um, many of that emperor's buildings or walls or memorials would be taken down uh, and that would be used in the next emperor's walls to signify that they had really conquered the space entirely. What is that process now? Are we still doing that? Um, a little bit. Uh, sometimes you'll see that, that people will reuse old buildings or take apart an old building and reuse it uh, with new life. Uh, but really what we're looking at now of, of what's available in current reuse, current recovery of building materials, uh, it's heavily on the residential side and on the industrial side, uh, but there is a quickly growing, um, quickly growing level of commercial reuse. So in the images on the right here, we can see that while there's you know, recycling of aggregate and of stone materials, for something like a wood truss, that is very easily reusable um, by evaluating the, the soundness of the wood uh, that can be used to put up a new building again tomorrow. Um, we can see the reuse of siding materials, of windows. Uh, here we've got some heating and ventilation equipment that can be reused. Uh, with some of the, the heating and ventilation equipment you always want to make sure that you're staying in line with energy efficiency requirements but there is a great opportunity for reusing those materials uh, as they are. Uh, for non-structural salvage, uh, as we talk about building material recovery, we're often going to differentiate between non-structural salvage and structural salvage or full building deconstruction. 
uh, what we're seeing frequently in non-structural salvage of what is currently being reused. Um, carpet uh, to a certain level, uh, for certainly carpet tiles uh, in the commercial level are being very actively reused and there's a very good emerging market for trading in carpet tiles on the national level. Uh, kitchen appliances. This is the bread and butter of many reuse stores. Um, certainly things like stoves, refrigerators, dishwashers, ovens uh, are very actively being reused very frequently, um, probably because kitchens are one of the most frequently remodeled things on, on projects. Uh, service appliances like furnaces, those types of things. Uh, it really depends on what the, the status is. If it's in good condition, yes, there's absolutely an opportunity for reuse. Cabinets, these are very frequently reused. Um, these are a, a high value item, but it really depends on what they were made of in the first place. Um, when you find some of the older cabinets, they'll be made of plywood, uh, which is a very stable wood uh, and stands up very well to continued use into the weather. Uh, unfortunately, with some of the newer cabinets that you'll see, they are often made of particle board. Um, particle board, unfortunately, does not respond as well to reuse. Uh, the screws tend to become very loose. Uh, the material loses its, its rigidity. Uh, in addition, if it's exposed to the weather at all or to moisture, it has a tendency to dissolve. So this is a great one to think about both when you are requiring um, people to install materials for the first time, is it going to be reusable, as well as which kind of cabinets are, are realistically eligible for reuse. Uh, and that's where you're really going to be looking at things that have a plywood construction or that have a uh, even a, a lumber construction in some of the more high-end cabinets. Uh, things like medicine cabinets, light fixtures. Light fixtures are an excellent opportunity for reuse. There's no reason why a, a fully assembled and functional light, light fixture needs to go to a landfill. Uh, finished wood floors and doors, dimensional lumber. Uh, these are some of the, well not dimensional lumber, but finished wood floors and doors. These are some of the very common non-structural salvage or recovery items. The things that all, all of these have in common is that the skill level is relatively simple for most of these items. When you get into some of the equipment, you really do want to call in a, a specialist who has knowledge of electrical and or gas appliances. Uh, but for the most part, this can happen with volunteer labor. Non-structural salvage is a really active marketplace for folks like Habitat for Humanity, church groups, um, architectural salvage groups. Oftentimes you'll see historic preservation groups who are working actively in this market. Uh, because there's not a lot of structural requirements, there's not a huge skill level and you can use volunteer labor. In terms of the extraction methods for non-structural salvage, uh, we've got the simply picket um, option as the first one, and these are for uh, MRFs and demo site extraction. Oftentimes you can just pick something up with your hands and reuse it. Um, it can be as simple as that. You've got unplug and pull, things like refrigerators. You really don't need to do much. You can just pull them right out. Uh, hand tool remover for fixtures, flooring, and cabinets. Power tool removal uh, using things like sawzalls for doors and windows. And then finally, team extraction for things like bathtubs, which can be quite heavy and unwieldy, or countertops, which retain a very high value, but again, can be quite large and heavy if they're stone. One example I wanted to make sure to bring up with all of you is a case study from Portland, Oregon. And this was Bryce uh, Jacobson, who works with the Metro Portland. Uh, it's a government agency, and he worked with a local transfer station to identify what opportunity there was to pull reusable materials from the waste stream. Now, this is no deconstruction. Uh, this is no special treatment. This is simply retraining the line workers to pull those materials that had a potential for reuse, teaching them to identify two by fours or useful items, things that were still recognizably good building materials. Uh, and they actually had a great success. You know, after a few situations in the first weeks with broken glass and broken ceramics, um, by the end of week six, they were really starting to get great recovery, um, particularly of wood materials. They were really starting to identify uh, great wood materials that could be easily reused. Uh, metals they were pulling uh, and sending into the recycling market, um, concrete. Uh, some ceramic uh, as well as some glass, but they really had a a great success with this project. And the one reason why I want to make sure that people are aware of it, the full case study is available at, at bmra.org, incidentally. The reason I want to make sure people are aware of it is that this was actually cost neutral. Um, they spent relatively little money in the beginning on retraining the workers and on providing some simple tools. Uh, but they were able to do this in a cost-effective manner because they were able to sell back a lot of the metals that were being recycled. Um, they were able to uh, put the, the wood materials back into the reuse stream. Unfortunately, the, the 
owner of the transfer facility decided not to maintain it, um, which was a real shame because what this did is really provide evidence that you can enter the recovery market at the most minimal level uh, before your locality or your contracting company has any uh, skills for doing non-structural or full deconstruction. There is an opportunity to just garbage pick and identify reusable items. Who are the major market players in non-structural salvage? Uh, builders. Builders are a huge player. Um, oftentimes you will see them reusing materials from one project to another. Deconstruction contractors. Uh, this is a growing area. Um, you'll see it certainly in the larger metropolitan areas, uh, as well as certain highlighted smaller metropolitan areas that have been very supportive of deconstruction. Habitat for Humanity. Um, they have a huge volunteer group and they do a lot of non-structural salvage. Demolition companies, um, they are now routinely engaging in a quick pass for material re removal of high value items. Um, any demolition company worth its salt will do a walkthrough of a building and identify something that they could sell for a profit or that would help make their project go more smoothly. Um, this is the standard business model for many high-end salvage stores. These are the folks who are getting stained glass, mantle pieces, um, those really beautiful built-ins. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing a couple of new market players. On-site auctions have become very popular. Um, this is single-day or two-day auctions where uh, basically an auctioneer goes around the house and says, all right, who's going to give me $10 for this light fixture? And sells off as many items in the house as they can. Uh, and they sell them very affordably, very low rates. Um, but the onus or responsibility for removing that material and transferring it then comes down to the buyer. So it's an interesting hybrid. For the motivated buyer, it's a great way to get really nice pieces at an affordable price. Uh, and for the auctioneer, it's a great way to just kind of sell things almost for free. Uh, and now property owners are also starting to become much more active. Um, as there are more tools for accessing the market, property owners have become more active in it. Now full deconstruction. You're hearing me kind of throw some words around here. Uh, the whole session is called recovery. Um, recovery, removal of materials, picking, deconstruction. Uh, how does this work? Full deconstruction is basically a alternative to demolition. Um, demolition is fundamentally to destroy or render useless a material. Deconstruction is a methodology that's similar to dismantling. It's to take apart a building in such a way that its materials can be used again. Uh, now with full deconstruction as opposed to non-structural salvage, the whole goal of this is not just to make a profit, to cherry pick those things that are worth the most money or that are the most desirable. Full deconstruction is, the whole point of it is to get the building down and to ensure that you have a clear site. Now for a lot of municipalities, this is the goal. Um, particularly in the past few years as people have seen the recession and a huge amount of abandonment in vacant homes, the point is to get the building down. It has become a blight on the neighborhood. It needs to be removed. Uh, most of the really nice things in it honestly have probably already been cherry picked. But by using deconstruction as opposed to demolition, there's a real opportunity to uh, return those materials to the supply market, whether that's dimensional lumber, whether that's sheathing materials, uh, whether that's stone blocks, or fixtures. Uh, this is the great opportunity to provide more jobs and uh, really use that as a growth site rather than just as a demolition site. Uh, when we're doing full deconstruction, structural issues become more significant. Uh, at this point, most people are not relying on a volunteer team. You really need at least partially skilled labor or mildly trained labor at this point to safely deconstruct a full building. Uh, the breadth of material types and conditions will usually result in some recycling, um, whether that's pipes that are coming out of the wall that are going into a recycling market. Um, and then you're often going to see some landfill waste. Um, when you take down a full building, oftentimes you'll have some concrete aggregate that will go to hopefully a recycling outlet, uh, but you're also going to have some mixed debris, some drywall um, that is likely to end up in the, in the landfill market. In terms of the materials that people are often getting out of full deconstruction, uh, insulation is one of the most valuable ones that's coming out. It's usually very easy to remove, uh, particularly if it's fiberglass or rigid board insulation. Uh, we are seeing a bit of a problem as people are using more spray foam insulations uh, because a spray foam insulation actually renders both the insulation and the wood it is attached to completely unusable. Uh, spray foam insulation equals landfill. Uh, but for fiberglass insulation, steel wool insulation, rigid insulation, anything that's using a bat or a board, that is reusable. Uh, Ductwork. Uh, even though there's a great scrap value and it tends to hit the recycling market a little bit more frequently, rigid ductwork is certainly eligible for reuse. 
uh, roofing. Um, the higher value ones are going to be uh, like slate roofs or ceramic roofs, uh, red tile roofs that are easily reusable. Uh, but we are seeing that, that it is happening. Uh, and I think especially as we see more removal of, of the new kind of s steel um, or aluminum roofs, that that will be a big reuse market as well. Uh, sheathing, lumber, exterior siding, all of those wood products have an excellent reuse value. Uh, and then finally brick. Uh, depending on what area you're in, and, and really honestly in almost all areas of the states, we do see a good value on brick um, and on removing that brick and reselling that brick. How do people do this? What does it mean when you've got deconstruction? Um, does that mean that you're going to have 100 people show up for, for a month to take down this building? No, there's a, a lot of different methods and they'll have different implications for what it's like on site versus off site. We've got all hand deconstruction. Um, this is a student team up in Winnipeg, Canada taking down these really beautiful historic barns. Um, in this case they were actually studying the construction of the barn to retain that knowledge of how the building was built um, as much as to get the materials down and, and resell them. Uh, so this is all hand deconstruction where you have folks going in there with pry bars, um, with hammers, really taking apart the materials. Uh, here we've got an example of hand, mu hand plus machine deconstruction in place. Um, this is what's often called uh, hybrid deconstruction, uh, making use of different tools for what they're most effective at. So on the left hand side you can see them using uh, a cherry picker uh, as well as I believe they had a, a, a forklift as well. Um, and so they were using that to take down some of the materials that were higher up on the building, take down some of the galvanized roofing and the sheathing. Uh, that's then augmented by the hand. Um, you can see them using the hand materials on the right hand picture uh, where they're taking down the interior sheathing. Panelized deconstruction. Um, this is sometimes used when you want to use machines. Um, as you can see on the top left hand side, what they've done is they've used a saw to cut out portions of the, um, of the roof and then take that by machine uh, and put it on the ground. One of the great benefits of this is that you've got a safer environment for your workers, uh, so you have far fewer OSHA concerns, liability concerns, uh, but you also can get greater recovery because um, when you've got people working safe and working on the ground, uh, they can work with just those panels and really highlight the recovery for those panels. Uh, and then finally we're also starting to see in some cases something called knockdown deconstruction and basically what they've done is is rather than um, rather than eat away at pieces of the building uh, when you've got something that can can kind of be tipped over a little bit um, it's sort of like the the three little pigs you know I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down if you kind of knock it to the side if it's a, a structurally uh, loose building or a wood frame building sometimes you can knock it to the side and then just pick the pieces out um, so rather than, than destroying it or demolishing it, um, you're using a way of, of turning it over as quickly as possible uh, and then just picking through the wood. So now the question becomes you want to include reuse, you want to include recovery and deconstruction. Uh, when should you really pay attention to it? Um, should this only be on new construction projects that you require them to incorporate reused materials and drive that market supply? Should it only be for, for demolitions, for replacing demolition as practice? Well, realistically, it should be happening all the time. Um, if you're thinking about encouraging a policy or thinking about how to include this on your own projects, the vast majority of waste, that vast majority of C&D construction and demolition waste that are hitting, is hitting our landfills really comes from renovation projects. Um, renovation projects tend to be about time. Um, people want them to happen very, very quickly uh, and they tend to be about quality. People are doing them because they want a specific upgrade. Uh, and so there's not as much focus on the environmental concerns uh, and those tend to get landfilled um, when we look at the construction waste. Um, not a lot of, of waste is generated during new construction. It's mainly overages, things that could directly go into the reuse market. Uh, but then certainly demolition is a huge part of it. So we want to have recovery and reuse be a priority on every kind of project, um, not just isolated to one or the other. How is it incorporated? Uh, what is in a work plan for a deconstruction project? Well, first of all, it's identifying the targeted materials for removal. What can come out of a building? Uh, and this is going to vary widely. Um, this is really based on a walkthrough. Is it a concrete block structure? Is it a stone structure? Is it a structural wood structure? Is it a uh, concrete building? 
So we want to look at the what materials we can realistically get out of this building and then start looking at what are the methods for removing that material. Is it going to be by hand, by machine? Is it going to be on-site? Is it going to be off-site? Based on that, you identify your staffing and labor plan, your equipment plan, uh, and then in total that will be your material management plan. How are you going to take those materials off and protect their value? If we are looking for highest and best use, it does us no good to take all of our timbers off and then uh, stack them messily outside uncovered and just to have them be rained on. So you need to have a material management plan. How are you going to handle and transport those materials and get them to market? Uh, and then finally, of course, any work plan is going to have compliance with the specifications in the contract language. So how are you going to meet the requirements on that bid? How do you maximize material reuse? So this is both for maximizing the quantity of material reuse and the quality of material reuse. Uh, like everything else, it's about setting a goal. Uh, if you don't have a target, you're not going to make it. Uh, and then estimating the material recovery, how much are you really going to get? If you take off all of that sheathing, what portion of it is going to have water damage or decay damage? Are there termites in the building? You want to be honest about your material recovery. You want to identify the delivery markets. Who's going to buy it? Um, if you've got a wonderful project and wonderful materials, but they're in the middle of nowhere, how are you going to continue to get them to market. So you really need to identify what your delivery market is. Um, efficient moving, loading, and transporting of materials is critical. You absolutely need to take care during all of those stages. Uh, light fixtures are one of the best areas of resale, uh, but they're also one of the easiest things to damage. If you spend a lot of time getting them out of the building only to have them crushed in the trucking process, all of your labor has gone down the drain. Um, selling a broken light fixture is a pretty difficult thing to do. So efficient moving, loading, and transporting of materials is, is critical. Um, and also to minimize the amount of miles traveled. Uh, I think as we all know, paying for gasoline and transportation expenses is one of the biggest parts of any material. So we want to make sure that we ha keep that really efficient. Again, retaining material value. Um, looking at opportunities for creative reuse. Is it going to be reused as the original way? Um, for instance, a lot of folks will look at a door and say, okay, well, can it be reused as a door? No, well, maybe it can be reused as a countertop, or perhaps it can be reused as a uh, wallboard, or perhaps it can be used to make a coffered ceiling. What is that real opportunity for creative reuse, looking at things with a new light? Uh, and then finally, you always want to make sure that you're aware of appraisals. Uh, oftentimes with material recovery and reuse um, for restores or similar resale opportunities that are nonprofits, uh, they are often accepting donated materials that they then sell in order to fund their mission. Uh, for any material donation that is over $5,000, the owner needs to get an independent verification of that uh, material's value. So that's the appraisal process. You want to make sure that you're aware of that. Anytime you've got something over $5,000, there needs to be an independent appraisal of that building materials value. And then finally, third-party verification of materials. If you're going to, for instance, reuse wood trusses, uh, who's going to say that those are structurally sound? Uh, there's a couple of different options. On the wood side, there's lumber grading, uh, and there are some standards that can be applied to reuse lumber um, from the different forest grading agencies. Uh, in addition, any project that has a structural engineer on it. Any structural engineer has both the knowledge and the ability to verify whether those materials are structurally sound. And this applies not only to wood materials, but also to things like precast concrete materials, steel. Steel beams can be reused quite easily. Um, but you do need to work with your structural engineer to ensure that they are confident in that material and, and willing to stand by it for its reuse. In terms of the process steps, how does that really work? Uh, you want to take a look at your local infrastructure. Um, how is it going to support you? Estimated material recovery, um, accomplishing that efficiency and handling that we spoke about. Um, identifying which of your materials are going to be reusable, which are going to be recyclable, uh, and which are unfortunately going to have to hit disposal. In terms of the market resources and identifying what's available to you, um, really the easiest is going to be uh, on-site sales in many opportunities, or that's going to be the most efficient. Uh, then you're not dealing with shipping or transport. Sometimes you can even cut out some of the removal steps. 
Uh, the next step in proximity is looking at reuse stores. Uh, how can you get it to your local reuse store so that they handle uh, finding a customer for you, that they they are the marketplace, uh, so you can just deliver it to the marketplace. And then finally, internet sales. Um, this is increasing your reach. You can often reach a much wider geographic area than if you were just doing on-site sales or reuse store sales. Uh, and we are seeing a huge growth in internet sales, both through kind of excuse me, formal uh, market structures, uh, as well as through places like Craigslist. What are the key concerns as you look at your market resources? Uh, you always want to be aware of quantities and quality. Um, that's what everybody's interested in. If I'm going to put new siding on my house and get it from a reused source, I want it to be of great quality and I want to make sure that there's enough of it. Having three quarters of it doesn't work for me. I need all of it uh, because I'm not going to be able to go back to the store and get more tomorrow. So when you're working with reused materials, you need to be really conscious of how much do you have and how much does your, your buyer need. Uh, material brokers. Uh, we're seeing many more material brokers emerge in the marketplace and they can be a real asset, particularly for commercial projects. Uh, and then finally, shipping and transit. It is always an issue um, for every material, whether new, reused, recycled, anything. Um, so be aware of what are the shipping and transit options and how can you really maximize that. In terms of identifying your local material, uh, your local delivery markets, uh, our organization, the BMRA, does maintain a directory of reuse stores around the country, uh, so you can check our website. Honestly, your local Yellow Pages, um, people overlook them. Uh, there are a lot of great resources out there, and like uh, real estate, reused materials is very much a local market. Um, you are going to find your best resources locally. Craigslist, like I said, there's a lot more activity happening there. Uh, Planet Restore. They are starting to aggregate national listings. So in terms of identifying materials um, to buy as well as outlets to sell materials, they have a really interesting model that is growing significantly. So take a look at Planet Restore. Uh, and then finally the EPA. Um, they also look at options, particularly if you're looking at hazardous wastes and, and recycling markets. The EPA does have some, some good references there on their website. In terms of how this all is incorporated and represented, uh, I included a, a work plan sample spreadsheet here. So you can get an idea of how similar it is to uh, a general project waste management plan. The main difference is that you're going to see for a reuse or a recovery uh, work plan is that you're going to get some, some notes about critical path, uh, you know, when does it need to happen. Uh, and then you're also going to get some notes about what's your target diversion market. You know, who is going to buy this and how am I going to package it and how am I going to ship it to them. Uh, I'm going to track my materials much more closely uh, so that I can really identify my marketplace. And I'm going to look at the amount of staff that I need and the amount of equipment that I need so that I really understand every step along the way of what it is going to take from the material where it is currently installed to get that material to market effectively, efficiently, and, and profitably. In total, how does this relate to the larger picture of triple bottom line that we're looking at? You know, what is the economic benefit of reuse? Uh, on the supply side, uh, there's a valuable outlet for materials. You know, anytime that you've got a building that you're taking down, taking it to the landfill is costing you money for hiring a, uh, a bucket or hiring a... Um, a yardage container to get rid of that material, paying landfill and tipping fees, paying shipping fees. Uh, so when you get into the reuse market, all of a sudden you've got materials that people will actually give you money for, or you've got donation receipts for goods. If you're taking down a full building, um, those materials can actually get into the tens of thousands of dollars uh, that you can get a donation credit for giving those buildings to a, a nonprofit like the Habitat Groups. Uh, and then you've got the avoided tipping fees. Even if you're going into reuse and you don't get a receipt for the donation and nobody buys it from you, at least you're not paying the tipping fees for, for it. Everything that you can do to reduce your expenses uh, is a good thing on the supply side. And on the demand side, if you're a contractor um, or you're a building owner looking to put up a new building or a renovation, uh, you can usually get reused materials at a very affordable price. Um, for the higher end ones that are a bit rarer, yeah, you're going to pay a little bit more. Things like wide, soft pine board, that kind of thing. Uh, but for the most part, a 2x4 that's been reclaimed is going to be cheaper than a new 2x4. And I can also promise you it's going to be a heck of a lot straighter. Uh, so you've got a real outlet for high quality things like solid doors or panel doors um, that are far more affordable than you're going to find new. What's the environmental impact of reuse? Um, well, this is a, a recent study that came out just within the past two years. Uh, this was looking at dimensional lumber, um, and it was looking at the impact of reuse environmental, a full cradle-to-grave assessment. 
So this was looking at cumulative energy impact for extracting a tree from the earth uh, and processing it and then landfilling it. Um, this study is available in full on the BMRA's website along with a calculator that you can use to calculate uh, the cumulative energy impact for your project. But when we look at new framing lumber, um, we're looking at almost 6,500 megajoules per cubic meter compared to recovered framing lumber at 320. So that is, that's 1 20th of the amount of energy. So there's a huge environmental savings, huge energy Im uh, or impact of uh, embodied energy um, that is being retained. And then finally looking at the impact of reused jobs. Um, this is how I tend to look at the ethical aspect of it. You know, if we look at people, planet, profit, what is it that people need? Um, people need employment, you know, quite honestly. And when we're looking at a lot of reuse opportunities, we're usually looking at depressed neighborhoods. Um, so these are entry-level laborer jobs um, that are really available. When we look at a study from the TELUS Institute that was presented about in 2011, it took a look at the reuse and recycling industry, at the economy as a whole. And this is not just building materials. This is looking at um, all recycling and reuse jobs from picking on the line to processing those materials. And it was showing that there were seven jobs per thousand pounds of municipal solid waste. Uh, compared to less than one job that was created in a waste economy. Seven to less than one. There's just an enormous opportunity if we can ramp up our material processing, uh, reuse, and recycling economy. This is actually the graphic that looked at the 2030 scenario. So what happens if in, you know, now in 17 years, keeps getting closer and closer, uh, in 17 years, if we take a look at the economy, if we still have a waste-based economy, um, you know, you can see that in the middle bar. If we have a waste-based economy that's looking at landfilling, uh, we're creating very few jobs. And we're probably also offloading those materials to another country um, or to folks who, who are in the more rural areas. Uh, if we compare that to a green economy scenario where we have high levels of reuse and recycling, uh, it's just hands down a better situation for employment for Americans. So there we have it. Those are the basics of building materials recovery and reuse. Uh, I hope that I've covered uh, your introductory questions, um, but there is a lot more out there in terms of opportunities, in terms of resources. Uh, if you need case studies, if you need additional information, I'd be happy to help you out directly. Uh, or our website does have a full library, um, especially our presentations over the last uh, number of conferences that we've had. We include all of our presentations so you can see things like that transfer station that I talked about in Portland, or you can see in Iowa how successful they've been with specifying deconstruction, despite the fact that they don't have any uh, reuse stores over in Des Moines, Iowa. So there are great opportunities. I look forward to, to hearing from all of you, uh, and I hope that you'll be encouraged to include reuse as part of your sustainable materials management. Thank you.